The teachings of Rabbi Ephraim Sprecher, Dean of Students at Diaspora Yeshiva on Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Pasha B'Shalach. It's an amazing verse. <clears throat> Where does the uh, term carry the torch for you? You ever hear that, Benish? I'll carry the torch for you. You ever hear that expression? When you love somebody, when in Brooklyn we were growing up, when you had a crush on somebody, you said, I'll, I'll carry the torch for you. You were saying in the Olympics. In the Olympics also? Yeah. No, but in Williamsburg, when I was growing up, that was, that was like an expression. Of, where does it come from? It comes from this week's Pasha. It's incredible. It comes from this week's Pasha. It says, God went in front of us by day with a pillar of cloud, and at night with a pillar of fire. God literally carried the torch for us. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Now from here you learn out an amazing halacha. We know that a king who's moichel on his covet cannot be moichel on his covet. Melech shmoch on kavoy da'in kavoy da'mochel. God is a melech malch elochim. Is it covet for God to carry the torch for us? But God is not just a king, he's also what? A Abba. And the law is that a Abba shmochel kavoy da'i kavoy da'mochel. So from here you learn now that a parent can serve a child. Benish, it's amazing. It says that God carried a torch for us at night and he led us a pillar of a cloud by day. Bamad Onan, Bayom, Elila Bamadesh. From here we learn out that God is a loving parent, and a loving parent can be Moichalus covet and do for what? Avi for his child. Isn't that amazing halacha? A king cannot, but a parent can. Be moichel his, uh, his kavod. So, the exodus from Egypt, right? This week is called uh, Shabbat Shira. This week is called Shabbat Shira, the Shabbos of song. Why is it called the Shabbos of song? Because we sing the song of praise to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. In fact, this song is so important, Avi, that you say it every morning. You say it every morning in the davening. Why is it so important that we say Shira Tayam every day in the davening? Shabbos Shira, the Shabbos of song. And this Shabbos is accustomed to take a bird to lunch or eat a bird for lunch. It's an amazing halacha. We know that the halacha is you're not allowed to eat unless you feed your animal first. That's your animal. So great rabbis would buy a pet in order to do the mitzvah of feeding their animal before them. But on Shabbos, you're not permitted to feed strange animals. Your animal you have to feed, otherwise you can't have the children. But animals that don't belong to you, the Chazal say it's muktz, it's extra tircha, so you're not supposed to feed strange, wild animals that don't belong to you on Shabbos. But this Shabbos, the Orach HaShulchan says, the rabbis will wave away their iser, and this Shabbos there's a minak to feed the birds even on Shabbos, even though they don't belong to you which is normally muktza, but the rabbis will wave away their muktza, says Rav HaShulchan, because of Akkara Satoiv. What's Akkara Satoiv, Chava? Gratefulness. To the what? To the bird brain. To the birds. The grateful to the birds. How do we know to sing to God? La 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 la. How, does, how do we know that God loves to be serenaded? The birds, Avi, the birds are constantly singing to Hashem. So the birds taught us that what? To sing to, to, sing to God. So since the birds taught us to sing to God, because they're always singing to God, therefore we're makir to them. But uh, Mickey, I don't understand, Does the bird has a bird brain. He knows why we're feeding it. He knows because his great grandpappy taught us to sing it in the midbar, that's why we're feeding him. The bird doesn't know anything. So a chorus of toif is not for the bird. It's for what? Us. us. Who said that? In order to develop my nishama, in order to develop my character, and my tikkun and nefesh, I have to express chorus of life. It's not for the birds. It's for the birds, get it? Alfred Hitchcock. It's not for the birds, it's for me. My nishama to develop for her eternity needs to express gratitude. And therefore, this Shabbos, rabbis will wave away the Isra and you'll have to feed strange birds on Shabbos or chorus of life. Normally, you cannot feed animals that don't belong to you on Shabbos because it's mukta. But this Shabbos, birds is an exception. Look how far Hakoros HaToyv goes that the rabbis will wave away their Issa Mukta. So says the Orech HaShulchan. Okay? Hakoros HaToyv. Now, if you look at the Shira Tayam, the first of all, where do you learn out Tchiat HaMetim? It says, then Moshe and the Jews will sing. David, it should have said they sang, but it doesn't say 
they sang, it says they will sing. So the Talmud in Sanhedrin 91 says, what do you mean they will sing? They've been dead for centuries. So from here, Chazal learn out, that Moses and the entire Dora Midbar, at the end of time, will what? Wake up and sing again. Therefore it says Moses and the Jews will sing, not that they sang. So this is one of the main sources for Chiyat HaMeshim from the Torah. Sanhedrin 91 learns from here, from the Shira Tayam, Chiyat HaMetim. The dead will rise again. Moses and the whole generation, who've been dead for 3,300 years, will rise again and sing. So Babat Rebbe asked an interesting question. Why is this the source for Chiyat HaMeshim? What has Chiyat HaMeshim Moshe got to do with the song at the sea? Why is this the source for Chiyat HaMeshim? He makes an amazing observation. This is a week after the Exodus, right? Mamish a week after? How could they sing? They lost 80% of their relatives. Right? Chazal say that four-fifths died in Egypt. They're still sitting shiva. Avi, how could they sing? But once they heard Yashir in the future, once God told them that death is not final, we'll see our dead relatives again, La 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 Now you can sing. So therefore, Shira Tayam is the source of Chiyat HaMesim. Otherwise, how could they sing? They just lost 80% of their relatives behind in Egypt. But once they heard the promise of Chiyat HaMetim, that death is not final, the dead will rise again, now they're in a mood to sing. And therefore, this is the source for Shira Tayam in the Torah. On Sunday, we'll talk more about how and why this is our national anthem. Shira Tayam is our national anthem. That's for Sunday at 2 o'clock. But now we'll look at the Shira. If you see the way it's written in the Torah scroll, it's written with huge spaces in between the words. Very strange. No other part is written. The Shira Tayam is written that way. Hazinu is written that way. The Shira Devorah, we'll get to, hopefully, the Torah is written that way. In every shir on Tanakh, there's wide spaces in between the words. Why is it written like that? So the Zohar says, one explanation is that uh, the Jews were in such an exalted mood to sing, they couldn't express it in human terms. So the blank spaces is the emotion which is above human words cannot be expressed in human terms. That's the blank spaces. Another explanation is that my Rebbe said, Rav Palm Zatzal, most you're going to like this, every one of us has to sing our shira to God. In the empty spaces, we have to fill in the blank spaces. We have to sing our own personal song to God. Thank God I live in Eretz Yisrael. I don't live in Shmutz Loretz no more. What a country, startup nation. The leader in high-tech, low-tech, everything. A little country, smaller than New Jersey. Everybody, 50 leaders from the world just came here to pay homage. And the whole world wants our technology. Africa, Uganda. We have to sing to God and realize the tremendous miracles that he's doing for us. So the empty spaces are banish. We have to fill in our personal shira to Kodesh Baruch Hu. Everyone in their, in, their own, uh, in their own words. In their own words. Now we say in the Shira, this is my God, and I will build him a sanctuary. Rav Hirsch translates differently. This is my God, and I shall become his sanctuary. Rav Hirsch, great man. Uncle says, this is my God, and I will build him a sanctuary. Hirsch says, excuse me, this is my God, and I shall become his sanctuary. Hmm. And the Baba Cherebi picks up on this. Why is the Mishkan, the tabernacle of God's presence in the, in the Midbar, why is it covered with animal skin? Isn't it strange? Says the Baba Cherebi. When you look at the Mishkan with the animal skin, it reminds you, I've got you under my skin. That's just a reminder. God doesn't dwell under the animal skin. He dwells under my skin. 
My goof is the house of the Shekhinah, or it should be. My skin. So the animal skin is a reminder that Kodesh Baruch Hu dwells under my skin if I let him in, as the Kutzka Rebbe said, right? Got to let him in. Got to make room for him. That Ze'eli Van Vehu, I will make my body a dwelling place for Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's what the Jews were singing uh, at the Red Sea. Now, <clears throat> It's just amazing that at the, the, the end of the Shira, at the end of the Shira, it says, Migdash Hashem Konyinu Yodecho. The temple of God, your hands have established it. So Rashi says that what? That this is a sign for the third temple. Because the first two temples were built by human hands. But Migdash Hashem Konyinu Yodecho, says Rashi, they're, speak, they're singing about what? the final Migdash, and the final Migdash will be established by what? By divine hands. That's what the Shira says. But, in Pasha's Truman it says, V'osili Migdash. You Jews have to build me a Migdash. So these two psukim seem to clash, Avi. Here it says that the third temple will be built by divine hands. In Pasha's Truma, there's a mitzvah to build the temple with human hands. So it seems to be what? A contradiction. And to make uh, the, the contradiction even more, more uh, sharp, Rashi and Tosfos and Sukkah say clearly, based on this pasuk, that the third temple will be built only by divine hands. Rambam in Hulchus Beis Abchira says, wait a minute. Also Li Migdash, the Rambam quotes not this pasuk, Pashas Truma, where there's a mix of for human beings to build the third temple. So which one is it? Will it be built by divine hands or human hands? Yes. Yes. Abba said yes. <laughs> Ezekiel prophesizes the third temple. And according to Ezekiel, why is he giving me the divine plans if Rashi and Tosos are right? That the third temple will be strictly by divine hands. Why is Yecheskel? In chapter 40 through 46, why does he give such great, in, what's the word, intricate and precise detail of the third temple? Who cares if it's all going to be God? So it looks like the Rambam is right. Otherwise, why you need the blueprint down to the precise millimeter? So therefore, the Vilna Gaon, the Rasam Soifis, say it's not Machlokis, like Chava said. It'll be a joint effort. A joint effort. Who said, build it and he will come? Uh, build it and he will come. God will supply the building and we will supply the furniture. And that's what Mochan Amigdash is all about, Moshe. Mochan Amigdash. We got the Kalem ready. We're doing our part, God, and therefore what? You have to do yours. So there's no machlokis. Your hands will establish the building. We will do the furniture. It'll be a joint effort. So happy together, right? And therefore, there is no machlokis between these, uh, these two psukim. Then the Torah goes on, and uh, Miriam sings with the ladies. Now, Miriam sings with the ladies, and she takes out tambourines and drums. Rashi wonders why only the ladies took tambourines and drums. Why didn't the men? So Rashi says the righteous women of the generation knew that the highest way to worship is HaKadosh Baruch Hu is what? to musical instruments. Even men didn't know that. The highest service on planet Earth to serve God is through musical instruments. Even Moses didn't know that. It's Tafke, the women who have a Bina Yitera, they're the ones that went to the Sam Goody stores and they took tambourines and drums. And therefore the Maral says something amazing. He says the word emuna is feminine. Why? Because women have more emuna than men. Women are more in touch with their neshama. The word amunah is feminine, the word neshama is feminine, the word shkina is feminine. Women have a, a bina yetera, and therefore they went, the men went for the jewelry. And the women went for the tambourines and the drums, because Rashi said they knew that that's the highest form of service. That's what King David learned, that's what the Levites learned, to serenade HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Veshlom HaKalbach, Satsal, with music is the highest form of service, and that's what the ladies Miriam and the ladies taught us that. Pretty interesting, right? 
Now she's called the sister of Aaron. Why is she only called the sister of Aaron? Isn't she the sister of Moshe Rabbeinu as well? It says Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a drum and tambourine. So why isn't she only the sister of Aaron? Is she the sister of Moshe? So Rashi said she was already a prophetess before Moses was born. When she was only the sister of Aaron, as a little girl, she prophesied, my mommy is going to have a baby who will be the savior of Israel. So she was already a prophetess when she was only what? The sister of Aaron. Before Holy Moses was even born. Therefore she's called Achot Aaron only. Then the Jewish people, there experienced the heights Rashi quotes Chazal, a lowly maidservant saw more godliness at the Red Sea than the greatest Nevi'im. You hear? A lowly maidservant had a greater prophetic experience, close encounters of the third kind, than the greatest Navi. So what happened, Chava? Three days later, what happened to the ecstasy? It turns bitter. They have the heights of Kedusha and prophecy. They go three days later, they find no water, and they come to a place, and they can't drink the water because they are bitter. Who's bitter? The water is bitter. Bashemtov says, no. Before Zygmunt Freud, Bashemtov said that when a person is depressed and sad, whatever he eats tastes bitter. bitter. The water wasn't bitter, they were bitter. So therefore the water tasted bitter. Yehuda, what happened? What happened? You are at the heights of ecstasy in Kiddusha, pointing to God, the greatest prophecy more than the Cheskel Anobi. Three days later, why do you become bitter? What happened? What happened? Remember that song, Banish? Riding high in April, shot down in May. Who sang that? Oh. Said Rav Tzadik HaKohen. Rav Tzadik HaKohen, Lahav Dalel who died in 1900, before Frank Sinatra. He says, this is what the Torah is teaching. In this world, no matter how high you're flying, there has to be a letdown. There has to be bitterness when you experience happiness and ecstasy. There has to be that way. Why is that? That this world is a roller coaster. Why? Says the Ramchal Moshe. Why? Not to become too attached to Olam Hazeh. You might think this is it. If everything is what? A joy ride. Right? Everything is Kriyas Yamsuv. You might think that is that all there is? This is it. So purposely after the great moments of joy and ecstasy, there's got to be a letdown, says the Ramchal and Ramchal Kohen, to teach that this world is only what? Fantasy Island. It's only temporary. Temporary. I sound like, what's his name? Temporary. So to remind us of that, in all life there has to be bitterness. It's a reminder that this life is not the end, it's not the goal, it's only the beginning a prelude remember that. what remember that and that's the message we're not learning ancient history Chava this is the way it is right life is a roller coaster yes and then Hashem shows him a tree and the tree makes the water sweet what is that all about the tree represents the eight Sachayim when a person is bitter and depressed, instead of spending his money on a psychiatrist, let him come to the Yasri Shiva, to the OU. Let him study the Eitz Achayim. Right, Bachmiel? That'll sweeten up his life. Person is bitter, and all life has bitterness. Open up the Eitz Achayim. What's the Eitz Achayim? The Tater. And then your bitterness will become sweet. You'll change your attitude. Powerful message in the parsha of the week hmm now this week's parsha god calls himself ani hashem roifecha i am god your doctor it's the only profession that god calls himself nechumish not creator which he is father king but he calls himself ani hashem i am god your md 
Therefore, every Jewish mother wants her son to be my son, the doctor, because it's my. Get it? Ani Hashem Reifecho. Rav Tzadik Cohen points out something amazing. He says, all the sicknesses that I brought on Egypt, I won't bring on you because I am Hashem, your doctor. If he won't bring sickness, what are you a doctor for? He died in 1900. Rav Tzadik Cohen. In fact, Rav Wein says that he, he's related to him. He says he's his great, 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 great uncle. But anyway, uh, if God won't bring any illness, then why do you need a doctor for? Is there a doctor in the house? That's only what? But it says God won't bring no sickness. So why are you a doctor for? Who said an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of a cure? Who said that? I think Ben Franklin. Oh, but where was I? So Rav Tzadik said, we're not reading the verse properly, Moshe. Doesn't say it won't bring sickness. It says, the sickness that I brought on Egypt, I won't bring on you. Very important difference. It doesn't say it won't bring sickness. Loyalani, would you get sick, Loyalani? But when a goy gets sick, that's a punishment. But the sickness that I brought on Egypt, I won't bring on you. Ken Hashem Reifecha. Well, Loyalani, would you get sick? That's not a punishment. That's for the mitzvah. But Leilani, when a Jew gets sick, that is what? That's the refuah. You hear what I just said? The Torah is teaching that Leilani, when a Jew gets sick, that the, the ill of the body is the cure for, for the soul. When the body Leilani suffers illness, it's not a punishment. It's the Torah Shafua. When a doctor goes a painful operation, is he punishing the patient? No. He's doing Rafua. So God says, I'm Dr. Goldberg. Ani Hashem Fecha, calling Dr. Gold, Dr. Ben Casey, remember him? A calling Dr. Kildare. Right? It looks like the doctor's being cruel, but he performs open heart surgery. Is he being cruel? Looks like it. So God says, I'm a doctor. Loyalainu, when I have to perform painful surgery, Loyalainu, on a yid, it's bitoras refua. All pain is like a doctor inflicting painful surgery. And that's the paradox, says Rab Tzadok. When the body is afflicted, that's exactly the cure for the neshama. Keni Hashem Isn't that amazing? The doctor is not being cruel. He wants to save the patient. So God is our doctor. And the affliction of the body, that's the cure for the neshama. Pretty interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Very interesting. So of all the miracles that afterwards we have the mun. How come there's no Monday? Monday. The Ebenezer says that the greatest miracles of all is man because that lasted 40 years so we have a day to commemorate Pesach splitting of the Red Sea and the Exodus and the magic cloud Sukkot how come there's no Yom Tov to commemorate Monday 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 why, why is there no Yom Tov to commemorate you have a Yom Tov to commemorate the magic clouds of glory right Sukkot isn't donuts from heaven as miraculous as magic clouds from heaven? So have a yonte for the magic clouds from heaven called Sukkot. Why not have a Monday for donuts from heaven? Hmm? Tell us. Monday. Hmm? Monday. So my great great grandfather Ed Soska said something. He gave a mushal. And there's no yonte to be show Miriam. The magic water of Miriam. Ain't that more, more uh, miraculous than clouds from heaven? So you have Yontif and Sukkot, clouds from heaven. Why do they want to celebrate the man and the magic, uh, magic mountain? Magic mountain. Magic mountain that gave you Diet Coke, Pep Pepsi, Spur Zero, whatever you wanted. No Yontif. So he explained, B'nai Soskar, he explained amazing. He says, when you take your child on a 40-year hike in the desert, you don't take along a ample food and water supply 
which father would do less, Avi? That doesn't deserve a yontif. God took his only beloved child, B'ni B'chari Yisrael, on a 40-year hike in the desert. Is God not going to supply us with food and water? That doesn't deserve a yontif. But the Anane Yaakovot, that's above and beyond, that magic hug, all of our physical needs were taken care of. God even built us Boy Scout tents. Sukkah mamish. But the magic clouds from heaven, that's above and beyond the call of duty. For that extra loving hug, that's a yantif. But for food and water, Mikimia, no parent would do less. That doesn't deserve a yantif. Pretty interesting, right? Why there's no yantif for the man? So they called it man. It says, because they didn't know mahu. What is it? So call it mahu. It says, ki yodu mahu. So call it mahu. They, they spoke Hebrew. They went to Upan, right? Why they call it man? It, they didn't know what it is, mahu. So call it mahu. So Raoul says the word man is an acronym. Ma nevorech. They asked Moses, Ma nevorech, Avi, Man FBI, Memno, Ma nevorech, what bracha do you make? So Moshe told them, Hamotzi lechem min hashamayim. Now, what's a greater miracle? The Man or uh, a Danish from angels? Moshe, what's a greater miracle? Danish from angels. You're right. But most people would say Man, right? right. But I think no. Man, okay, came from heaven. How do you get a Danish? Delicious or Entenmann's cheesecake or a delicious roll. You take a, a seed and you plant it. It rots and decays. And then up pops these sweet stalks. And it takes 10 stages to take this wheat. You cut it and you grind it and you winnow it and you take it and da, 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 And you turn it into a delicious Danish or a hot roll. Who says that's any less miraculous than donuts from heaven? Here you take a seed, you've planted, it rots and decays. And out comes delicious wheat stalks. I think that's just as miraculous. But we take it for granted. When you make a mozi lechem in aretz, we have to have in mind it's just as spectacular, Moshe, as a mozi lechem in Hashemayim. Perhaps even more so. And that's the message. That's the message of the, the trek in the desert to thank God that whatever we have, even what food and water that we think is what? Nature. It's all what? Miraculous. All miraculous. Not to take any of God's gifts uh, for granted. You know why Jews love ice cream? You scream ice cream. We all scream for ice cream. Uncle says... You can look it up, Exodus 16, 14. The man was glida. Uncle says glida. Ice cream. Ice cream. That's why we love ice cream. You... Uncle says the man was glida. Mm. Chocolate, I hope. So. Uh, <laughs> like anything you wanted, you just had to fantasize. You had to concentrate, right? The Torah calls it lechem. But lechem, Rashi points out in, in Hebrew and in the Bible means food. It doesn't just mean bread. Lechem is a genetic term, Rashi says, for food. But Uncle says it was glida. Pretty amazing, huh? It was glida. Now, <clears throat> pretty interesting. So the Jewish people ate man for 40 years. 40 years they ate the man. Now the man was lavan. Therefore there's a minhag that on the chalice they put white sesame seeds. Because Rashi said it the man resembled those white sesame seeds. And that's one reason why you put it on, on the challah. Lechem Mishnah. What does Lechem Mishnah mean? A double portion. Friday we got a double portion of man that lasted unto Shabbos. What's the message? There's an amazing Rashi. There's an amazing Rashi in the, right in the beginning of the Torah. When we make Kiddush on Friday night, you know what you're supposed to have in mind? When you make Kiddush, it says, God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. Says Rashi, how? 
by the month. That all week one Omer fell, and Friday a double portion fell. And Shabbos no mon fell. That's how God blessed and sanctified the Shabbos. But the mon happened 3,300 years ago. I'm never going to have mon again. So every time you make Kiddush on Friday night, why do you have to focus on the mon, says Rashi. Did you know this? David, you're making Kiddush Friday night. Look at Rashi, Beresh's bet. The text of the Kiddush. But the mon, that mon didn't fall on Shabbos. Some double portion fell on Friday. But the man is over and done with. What is Rashi talking about? Man is an eternal lesson, David. A double portion fell on Friday. A Jew might think, well, if I don't keep my store open on Shabbos, I'm going to lose out. So a double portion of man fell when? Friday. On Friday. If you keep your store closed on Shabbos, you're not going to lose anything. Look at the eternal message of the man. The money you're supposed to make on Shabbos, God will send you a double portion on Friday. So that's a message for eternity, not just for the man in the midbar. The man teaches that pranasa is all from a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And by keeping Shabbos, you're not going to lose anything. Because the, what you're supposed to make on Shabbos, God will give you more than adequate what? Twice when? On Friday. So you're taking the two loaves on Friday, what should you have in mind? When you're making Kiddush Chav, what should you have in mind? Wow. Rashi said, message of the man. You're not losing anything by observing Shabbos. What you're supposed to make, God will give you a double portion of that every Friday. When you look at the Chalos and you make Kiddush, you're supposed to remember that message. That by keeping Shabbos, you won't lose. Parnosa is all up to Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's the eternal message of the eternal message of the man. It's just amazing that the, um, um, the Barbanel points out that everything in the physical world has a counterpart in the spiritual world. Everything in Teva corresponds to Ness, or the other way. Everything in the supernatural world parallels what? The natural world. Where does man parallel the natural world? The man tasted like anything you wanted to, to taste. There's a posik by the man, the, it's called tofu. I'm not making this up. Look at Exodus 16, 23. The Torah says about the man, tofu. Tofu means to bake. Who's going to bake glida? So I want to say the word tofu is tofu. Isn't tofu the natural parallel to man? The man tasted like anything you wanted. Take tofu, it can taste like pastrami or chocolate ice cream. So my humble opinion, the Torah foresaw already tofu. So the Torah writes the word tofu. By man, that tofu is the uh, natural counterpart to the supernatural man. Because the Barbanel says that everything in the... Uh, Teva world has a counterpart in the Ness world and vice versa. So perhaps that's why the Torah uses the word tofu. Tofu is the natural counterpart to man. Tofu can taste like anything. Ice cream sandwiches, pastrami, you name it. Tofu. That's what the Torah uses by the man. Pretty interesting, huh? Now on Shabbat, the Torah here writes about Shabbat. Onek Shabbat is a great mitzvah. The Zohar Kodesh says something amazing. On Shabbat, Kaviyoko, God comes to play with us. And therefore, it's a mitzvah to have treats like what? Kugel and Chulint. The Zohar says, like a parent buys his kids goodies, Hashem buys us goodies on Shabbos. And therefore, what you spend on Shabbos, that's an extra cheshven. God said, that's on my cheshven, David. What you spend all year is on your cheshven. But the treats that you buy on Shabbos, the Gemara Beitza says, Yehuda, God says it's on me. So the Zoya says, it's like a parent treating his child with goodies on Shabbos Kodesh, so it's a mitzvah to have delicious foods that you like. If you like Cheerios, fine, but if you like Kugel and Shulman, go for it, right? Now at the end of the parsha, at the end of the parsha, Amalek comes in the first terror attack in history. The first terror attack, uh, Amalek comes and terrorizes us. Because right before that, 
the Jews said, is God bekirbenu im ayin? Is God in our kishkas or not? How could they say that? They just came out of the Red Sea. They just saw most of the greatest miracles. How could they say, is God bekirbenu im ayin? It's not a bizarre question, David. Hey, you just forgot the Red Sea just a week later. A week before. And all the plagues, you saw all the missing, and, and donuts from heaven. And the magic clouds with the, the pillar of fire. How could you say it's God be Kirbenu? But their mistake was God is in the supernatural razzle dazzle. Sure, God's in splitting the Red Sea and the Mun. He's in the big ticket items. But is he in my Kishkis? Is he really concerned in my little grinding nitty gritty day? That's what they couldn't fathom. Isn't he too busy for that? The message is that the same God that split the Red Sea, the same God that what? That made donuts from heaven and magic clouds and pillar of fire at night is the same God that decides whether I have a good day or a bad hair day. Whether I catch the bus or miss the bus. Whether someone will upset me or hurt me. It's the same God. Moshe, they couldn't fathom that. God really concerned whether I'm having a good hair day or a bad hair day. Sometimes you have a bad hair day. Just It's the same God who split the Red Sea. Hello, that's the message of Judaism. God is in my kishkis. And he controls every facet of life. But the Gemara on page 7 says, a person doesn't stub his toe down here unless what? He ordained it. That's Bikir Benu. Don't put God in a box. Don't limit him to the big ticket items. He's Bikir Benu. He's in my Kishkis. And if you can't believe that, you don't belong in Eretz Yisrael. Because of all of the hardship to live here, Moshe, the red tape, the bureaucracy, it's all part. Ayesha Hashem Bikir Benu, am I in? If you don't believe that God is in your Kishkis controlling every nitty-gritty part of your life, then you, you won't be able to make it here. Then Amalek comes. Then Amalek comes. Interesting, it says by Amalek, Hilochem be Amalek machar. Moshe says, go fight Amalek tomorrow, tomorrow. What's wrong with today? And that word keeps popping up in Megillah Sester. Before you know it, Moshe, I don't want to scare you. Um, Haman is Amalek. Esther keeps repeating the word machar. What is this hang up between Amalek and Machar? It says by Amalek Machar. And Esther, in the book of Esther, she's dealing with Amalekite Haman, she keeps saying Machar. What's it all about? That's Amalek's game plan. Live, enjoy life, be merry, do what you want, because tomorrow we die. That's the Amalek mentality. Live for today. Because there is no tomorrow. Once you're dead, it's all over. That's the Amalek uh, uh, trap, Avi. That's the illusion of Amalek. Therefore, keep saying, Machar, live for today. What they say? Enjoy life today. What? Live, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And then it's all over. Eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. That's the Amalek. That's the Yetzirah game plan. It was Esau. Esau, 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 Esau is the grandfather of whom? Amalek. Mr. Amalek. The word Amalek, paid to write this down, Moshe. The word Amalek is an acronym. Ayin od ma'at. Don't do tshuva now. Od ma'at. Wait, I'll start my diet tomorrow. I'll stop speaking Lashon Hara tomorrow. Od ma'at. The mem stands for machar. I'll start my diet tomorrow. I'll stop speaking Lashon Hara tomorrow. Lamid stands for what? Lo achshav. Not now. I'm not going to do tshuva now. Not now. And the kuf stands for kasha. It's too hard to do tshuva. Again, Moshe Amalek. Ayin od ma'at. Not yet. Give me a little time. Let me enjoy first. Mem. Machar. I'll do tshuva. Start my diet tomorrow. The lamid. Lo achshav. Not now. What's the hurry? Do tshuva before I die. I'm a young man. Not me, but I'm a young boy. All right? Machar. And the Lamed, Lo Achshav. So that's the game plan of Amalek. That's the smoke and mirrors. And every generation we suffer from Amalek. 
But before we can uh, defeat the external Amalek, we have to defeat what? what the the Amalek inside of us, Moshe. What's the Kuf? What? Kuf. Kuf. Kuf stands for Kasha. Oh, it's, it's too hard to stop speaking Lashon Hara. It's too hard to start off Yoimi. Isn't that amazing? Amalek. So let's not fall for the Amalek is Gematria Suffolk. Amalek is Gematria Suffolk. When you begin to doubt, is God really in charge? I'm having a bad hair day. Maybe it's not him. That's Amalek talking. Amalek is Gematria Moshe Suffolk. If you doubt that God's in charge totally, that's Amalek speaking. For more of Rabbi Sprecher's teachings, visit rabbisprecher.com.